countdown for a special drug squad unit in the north of Peru. New illegal coca fields have been discovered and are due to be destroyed. This drug war is financed by the USA, but they haven't won it. Another man is out on the drugs front. Jochen Wieser is working for the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, UNODC, and is there on a peaceful mission. <laughs> he is against the war on the coca farmers. He wants them to give up the coca voluntarily, and he's welcome. Landing near Tingo Maria, bang in the middle of coca land. Destroying the farmers' coca fields is a dangerous job. They often put out booby traps. Planting coca and selling it to the cartels provides a good life. The men of the special unit are dealing with a Sisyphean task. They have to rip out each coca plant individually with its root. The farmers curse the policemen. They call them traitors and mercenaries of the USA. You should be ashamed to invade our country and make us starve. I want to speak to the boss. Jochen Wieser is the good cop. He brings the farmers oil palm, coffee or cocoa seedlings, cash incentives and technical advice. 27,000 farmers are on board. They now live off alternative products and allegedly earn $500 a month with them. It's a green miracle. We went to all the areas where there was coca. We were successful everywhere, and always on the basis of the total trust of the population. It should be difficult to find another positive example of this scale anywhere else. But there is something fishy about Visa's Wonderland. Nearby, we find fields full of coca. Coca underneath UN palm trees. In 2013, Peru even became the world's greatest producer of cocaine, despite the much lauded UN program. Did it fail? Or even worse, is it a cover-up for the big cocaine business? At first, we believed the promises of the UN guys. I'd hoped that it is a good and sustainable alternative for coca and a blessing for our families. But later, I realized that a group of criminals had come to us under the flag of the United Nations. The good guy from Hanover? A criminal? He vehemently denies this and invites us on a tour. 30 years ago, he arrived in Peru as a young UN officer and found the mission of his life here. After all, thousands of farming families are now able to lead a legal life which is worthy of a human being. The money he has spent on the Alternative Development Program, some $100 million, is a good investment, he says. The first stop is the Oro Verde Association, meaning green gold. Marcelino Tapulima is a kind of flagship farmer. He has given up all his coca fields, and he now grows cocoa and coffee on five hectares with the help of the UN Office on Drugs and Crime. Jochen Visa is talking shop with him about a coffee fungus which has destroyed most of the crops. We used to be always afraid of the law. The work was illegal. Thanks to the people of the United Nations who started their work here in 1999, I managed the switch to coffee so I could get away from coca. How are you doing financially? Well, it's more or less okay, but not good. 
Our income is not enough for the investments we need to make to grow economically. After the interview, he tells us that his monthly net income is roughly $180, far below the $500 mentioned in UN documents. Among other things, the association produces organic coffee and it has its own laboratory. Visa's concept for the farmers envisages them producing high-quality products, which are money makers on the world market. In order to achieve this, he forced them to concentrate on growing one or two crops. Monoculture is a part of the re-education program. He's not happy with this coffee. He's also annoyed with his flagship farmer, Marcelino, who told us that he can't live off growing coffee. On average, they have an income of some $200 per month. That's not very much. The farmers must be happy with that, or else they wouldn't be doing it. So they're always grumpy about it, yes. A bit ungrateful, actually. On we go to the next flagship project the Olpesa palm oil business in Tokash. Managing director Arturo Hoyos is driving us himself. Jochen Wieser brought him to the UN. Previously, he had been working for Pablo Escobar, the boss of the Colombian Medellin cartel. You know what I told the board of directors? Mr. Wieser will come and bring us new projects. Do you know why he's coming to see us? because we were the only ones who saw him off in the manner that he deserved. That's true. I could suggest some progressive projects, oil palms and environmental protection, something of that nature. Yes, RSPO, the Cream Palm Seal for Sustainable Palm Oil. That's right, or something with reforestation. At any rate, your message must be a positive one. Well prepared, the two arrive in Tokash, headquarters of Olpesa. It is one of Peru's largest and most successful palm oil businesses, with 2,000 farmers. The association's leaders and the management accord Jochen Wieser a huge reception. The farmers here are obviously grateful to him. 20 years ago, they used to grow coca, cook cocaine, or they were the warriors of the radical left-wing Shining Path guerrilla who plunged the country into a civil war which left 60,000 dead. For many years I travelled with a gun in my pocket and led very different negotiations with these people. It was a very special situation. The farmers were caught in a catch-22 situation between the military and the terrorists. And we also fell between those cracks. Here you had some coca. There's one plant left. The association's president wants to make something clear. The coca won't grow tall around here because there is too much shade from the palm trees. The farmers who accompany us on our tour with Jochen Visa are hand-picked. But even they are not happy. Instead of coca, they are now dependent on another monoculture and suffer the low price for palm oil on the world market. My returns are too low. I don't have money for fertilizer. Without fertilizer, I won't get to a normal level of productivity. The farmers deliver their palm fruits to the Olpesa plant, where the raw oil is produced. A few farmers received some shares in the plant, but most of them just deliver the palm fruit and receive a lousy price. The ones who profit the most 
and domestic and foreign investors. They pocket dream dividends of more than 100%, or so they say, despite the low price for palm oil on the world markets. This would make Olpesa the most profitable plant in the world, which doesn't fit with the farmer's poverty. The laws of economy can't explain these miraculous profits. The managing director is trying to do that anyway. It's damn complicated. I have to make the small producers happy as well as the investors. These include Alpamayo, trading houses, Jochen. Many people have invested here. If I pay the farmers more for their palm fruit, the farmers are happy, but the investors suffer. So I see it from a pure business perspective. We are the only business in the palm oil sector with three lines of production. Palm oil, palm heart oil, and we make animal feed from the waste products. The diversification of the production is the reason why we are more profitable than others. A bank will give you a maximum of 10% per annum for a fixed deposit. Our shareholders received a dividend of 128% in 2014 and 2015. The oil mill as a gold mine for investors, including Jochen Visa. Did we get that right? As a UN official responsible for this enterprise, he should not be gaining personal profit from the farmer's work. He probably knows that. Is that why he covered his tracks? I don't receive any dividends because, well, okay, yes, a laughable amount, because my wife invested in it. That's it. I don't get anything. I know nothing about this. I just know that the returns are relatively high. That's right. When we are back on track with Arturo Hoyos, Jochen Wiese chats some more about the happy marriage of office and money. Every year they distribute a profit which is higher than the investment. Yes, it's crazy the amount of profit within that process. And not because they scam the farmers. I'll find out. Arturo, my wife Judith has $3,000 worth of shares. That is, I have them. What kind of dividend did they roughly yield in the last few years? In 2014, that was at least 15,000 soles. 15,000 per year? 15,000 soles, that was $5,000. So you basically got your investment back within one year. That's one of the things I regret so much, that I didn't invest $100,000. I could be pretty rich by now. He was allowed to buy shares as a UN representative? I don't think so. But you can do it with a trick, like he did. And why not? It's a good thing to invest into something you created yourself. You've earned it. And there is the risk, too. Nobody knew it was going to be such a success. It could appear questionable for you to mix interests, because on the one hand, you are a co-owner or shareholder, and on the other hand, you have a strong decision-making power in terms of which project gets supported. 
Sure, but in this case, you have to understand that with an initial volume of some $2 million, which is what the plant cost, my wife's participation of $3,000, which was the exact amount, doesn't have any significance. $6,000. Well, all right, 6000 but that doesn't have any significance, and there was no exertion of influence. During the visit in Tokash, Arturo Hoyos invites Jochen Wiese to take part in a new private plantation business. It will supply Olpesa with palm fruit in competition with the farmers. Jochen Wiese makes a quick decision and orders shares for $20,000. The tour continues. 200 kilometers to the south, in Aguaitia, there is another large palm oil business which was also founded by the UN. Its name, Olpasa. But Jochen Wiese doesn't come along. There are peasant leaders who don't like him, and vice versa. They denigrated him. Victor Baral is the former president of the UN Farmers Association of Aguaitia. Unfortunately, we realized after some time that the UN worked for their own personal gain, at our expense. You have to understand that I am just a small farmer and they went over my head. These people have economic power and they use their connections. Back then, Victor Baral fell from grace. Lost his position as the associate's chairman, didn't get any more loans. Today, he is so poor that he cannot even afford a moped. He has to walk the five kilometers to his palm plantation and still make serious allegations against the UN team. They had the plan to infiltrate and implant themselves in the governing body of our association. For that, they corrupted a number of farmers. Oh, with the help of loans, subsidies and beer, they took advantage of the fact that the farmers have very little education. In the end, they took all the decisions themselves and appointed the board of directors and managing directors as well. Jochen Wiese used a simple method to bring the business, which was founded for the farmers, under his control. He enforced the rule that the three farmers' representatives on the board of directors are always appointed by him. This way he controlled three of five board members. The farmers were presented with a fait accompli by Jochen Wiese's assistant, Celso Diaz. He informed us that they would transfer the business to us, but that they would determine who would sit on the board of directors. All 16 farmers' delegates who were present said, no, that's not possible, it's our business. Celso Diaz took a drag in his cigarette and said, no, gentlemen, we as the United Nations will determine your three board members. If you're not happy with that, listen up, people, just forget about it. We'll give this plant to a different association, not you. So the Farmers Association holds the majority of shares in the plant. But all decisions are taken by Jochen Wiese's representatives, whom he has placed on the board of directors and in the management. This may have led to cases of fraud. Once I asked the supervisor to show me the cargo log, how many tanker trucks had left the property with which amount of oil? He said, Victor, we only registered the arriving lorries, not the departing ones. There has never been any control of how much oil is actually shipped from the plant. Victor Baral has evidence of organized crime. The protocol of a board meeting of the Olanza palm oil plant has it in cold print. 10% of the oil is regularly sold on the black market. The farmer's representatives wanted to bring in the state attorney, but board member Enrique Eslava, appointed by Jochen Wiese, vetoed the decision. 
an investigation would only damage the business's image, said the UN representative. Back then, we tried to understand how this is working. It's not that easy. Stealing the oil. Yeah, exactly. That was an interesting thing. I can't remember how it worked. We understood it at the time. Why didn't you report it? It had already been dealt with internally. But it's a crime. The business was completely independent of us. You appointed the board of directors. Yes, as far as I know, a stop was put to all of that, and the people in question were removed from the business, or reported. I have no idea. For me, that was the end of the matter. No one was reported because your member of board prevented that. Well, I don't know that he did that. I can't say now. A network of board members and managing directors takes over the business. To the farmers, it seems like Jochen Wieser was pulling strings and distributing sinecures like a king. In 2007, the UN project leader buys the property on which the oil mill is situated on behalf of the Farmers Association. Six hectares for the plant and 60 hectares of adjoining land for palms, land belonging to the association now, or so the farmers believe, and they are wrong. I went to the land registry and was flabbergasted when I saw the file. The land we had bought for our plant didn't belong to us at all. It belonged to a corporation by the name of De Palma Sac. Who owns that? 50% of it are owned by Mr. Alfredo Rivera Luarte. The managing director? Well, he was the UN's project leader here at the time. The other 50% belonged to one Leonardo Pichetsky Olachea. And who is that? I don't know him. I've never seen him. But who knows? He may have been here before. A front man. Seems that way. Back then I didn't think of that. We were in shock, but today we know more. Who's front man? He can't be a frontman of Alfredo Rivera, only of his boss, Jochen Wieser. The United Nations never had a personal interest, nor any of the technicians, in keeping some part of the business. Everything was transferred to the people, 100% of it, many years ago. This means no United Nations staff member owns a part of the plant or anything else. No land either? Some technicians own some land, that's right. You too? I have some small pieces of land relatively close by, that's right. Jochen Wieser owns land connected with other UN projects too. He runs his own palm oil plantations and is a shareholder. It is logical to assume that he used his power as a UN representative and the nearly $100 million which he had to distribute to win financial gain for himself and his helpers. Didn't they notice anything in the UNODC headquarters in Vienna? We inquire, but so far we haven't been given an answer. Visa's permanent managing director, Arturo Hoyos, is a key figure in the UN's Peru network. In his spare time, Hoyos likes to play the guitar, and he knows about chemistry too. Do you know there is a new method now. You can obtain the pure cocaine directly from the plant. Unbelievable. That would have been great in your day. You could make good cocaine with that, right, Jochen? We used to have to make the paste and wash it. Wow. Say, are you hungry? Do you want to eat something? The good old Coke days are not over yet. Apparently, the trade with the white gold continues under the roof of the UN. In 2009, Arturo Hoyo's brother-in-law is arrested for transporting sulfuric acid for cocaine production. 
in a UN vehicle. Also, the chairman of the board of the UN business is caught with 14 kilograms of cocaine and is sentenced to seven years in prison. The cocaine dealers went about their business in Arturo Hoyo's periphery, but Jochen Wieser retains his managing director. He was in a special emergency situation when he slipped into this business, which wasn't as risky as it is today. And two years later, he slipped out of it again. He needed the help of his university friends and so on. And back then, it wasn't a problem to come to us and get rehabilitated, so to speak. <laughs> what is the tree nursery of the palm oil business today was a runway back then. In the 1990s, raw cocaine was flown to Colombia from here. The recipient, Pablo Escobar. Every day, there was a plane with 500 kilograms of cocaine on board. That's what the farmers tell us on our tour. The boss of this cocaine hoarder was the very man who is now again their boss. <laughs> Your people told me that you used to organize flights to Colombia with raw cocaine. <laughs> no, I was more or less, I was just the bookkeeper. You could think that the entire UN program called Alternative Development is, uh, how can I put this, an option for the people from the drug trade to... Ah, to exploit that. That's right, to launder their money. Yeah, sure, that's possible. That happened. I was involved in many UN projects, together with Jochen. For a long time, I was involved. We always made sure we picked the right people growing coca at the time. It was suitable for making a change. The change? Does that even happen? This man is doubtful about that. Pablo Ramirez Mori works in the regional directorate of the Ministry of Agriculture and knows the UN businesses well. He has occasionally visited them as an agricultural advisor. Shortly after our start in Tingo Maria, we discovered the first light green plantings in the forest. They are all coca fields, everywhere around the UN plantations. Down in the valley, the farmers grow oil palms. Further up, away from the main roads, they grow coca. They can't live off the oil alone. The authorities tend to leave the coca farmers alone. Too many people in Peru profit from the narco economy. Even further down, bang in the middle of the UN plantations, we find coca fields too. Coca underneath UN palm trees. There is even a mash tub where they produce raw cocaine. Apparently, the UN program Alternative Development serves as a cover up. It's not a true alternative, according to the motto of out of the coca, into the palm oil. The reality is different. On most of my inspection visits, I saw coca growing underneath the oil palms. Coca also grows in cacao plantations. But the coca plant needs sun. 
There is lots of light for the coca until the palms are tall. Then the new fields are planted somewhere else. The UN officials would know this. Yes. Will they tolerate it? They have to know. Yes, they know. It's an open secret in Peru that at least some of the UN projects serve to launder the profits from the trade with the white drug. A plant producing palm oil can't generate a profit of 128%. I'm not the manager, and I haven't come up with these figures. The money could stem from the illegal drug trade and is laundered here. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Why are you so sure? I'm totally sure. Lima, the capital of Peru, is the headquarters of the regional office of the UNODC, or Office on Drug and Crime Fighting. In 2012, Jochen Wieser, in his own words, got into trouble with his boss Flavio Mirella. He allegedly accused him of corruption. We ask Mirella for an interview. He agrees, but cancels shortly before the appointment, saying he wasn't the right person for legal matters. We inquire in writing with the UNODC headquarters in Vienna, where the non of Visa's superiors suspected that businesses like Olpesa were money laundering facilities for drug trafficking profits. Our question remains unanswered to this day. In 2013, Jochen Visa was deposed as the leader of the Alternative Development Project. However, this didn't change much. His network continues the work. Most of the companies which were set up with the UN Millions are privatized by now. The small farmers consider themselves the losers. Dolores Noriega runs a small palm oil plantation and is the leader of a small farmers association in the Ucayali region. Mr. Visa is in her bad books. She suspects that the businesses which were financed by the UN have by now all fallen into the hands of the so-called UN Mafia, with the help of frontmen and share transfers. The next milestone of this circle of friends would be an oil refinery to produce biodiesel for the world market. Three palm oil plants founded by the UN are involved in the project. On top of that, in Dolmasa, the little oil mill which, according to insider information, is the nucleus of the planned large oil refinery. A mysterious major investor holds more than 40% of the shares. People in the business call him Tio, meaning uncle. Who is behind this? Dolores Noriega has come to Pucalpa to do some research. In the land registry, she comes across the business's file who, on the board of directors, is the representative for the uncle. Maybe there is some sort of connection with Jochen Wieser? Tio's name doesn't appear anywhere, but on the board of directors, he is represented by several people from Jochen Wieser's inner circle. One of them is Maria Esther del Campo who was the managing director of UN oil mill Olpasa up until recently, and Visa's solicitor, Gino Renato Gersi. Here it is. The board of directors has decided. The company is the founding shareholder in the constitution of a closed joint stock company whose aim it is to produce and market biodiesel. So now they have their own business in Dolmasa, which will own 25% of the refinery shares. So that was the goal of all these moves. The United Nations can be proud of the fact that their officials have made themselves millionaires.
Das ist ja vollkommener Unsinn, das machen. That's complete nonsense. That's not happening. There's no point to do that. No private citizen would think of doing such a thing. Because the profitability is very low, around 1 to 2 percent, meaning it's a huge risk, which is not justifiable with such small amounts of palm oil. Indeed, the oil production of the businesses founded by the UN is not enough to operate a large refinery. But a private investor is going to remove this bottleneck. In the middle of the rainforest, thousands of hectares of forest were cleared and planted with oil palms. Pablo Ramirez Mori was there when the regional government sold the land to the major investor. Allegedly, he came recommended by Jochen Wiese. 12,000 hectares have already gone. 100,000 are the target. Pablo Ramirez Mori was responsible for the allocation of land titles. In 2010, the regional government instructed him to survey the rainforest for the investor. The investor had until then been in agribusiness in Asia. His name, Dennis Melker. This shooting star of the investor scene learned his trade at Credit Suisse. His motto is, besides coca, palm oil is the most profitable plant in the world. In the palm oil industry, look at the three parts, production, processing, uh, FMCG, okay? World's largest buyer of palm oil is Unilever. So you have billions upon billions of capital invested in the FMCG vegetable oil market. Well, cracking. Um, any questions, please, down at the front. Melka. No tenía autorización de impacto ambiental. Melka cleared the forest without an environmental impact assessment. Para desbosque. Without an authorization to clear the forest, just like that. If he had at least done the environmental impact assessment, it may have even been a legal way. For me, it's hard. I remember what it looked like when we visited the site. Now flying over it, I can see it's over, all cleared, without any consideration. It could have at least left 30% of the trees. Like the law envisages. But the business doesn't care about the environment. Do you know this man? Yes, Jochen. Who? Johan Jochen Wiese. Have you seen Jochen him together with Melka? Yes, once. That was when Melka came to Hucalpa to pick more forest areas than he already had. Wiese was also there. It was obvious they knew each other. I've never taken part in such a conversation. It's not my duty to serve Mr. Melker in any way. We have a very clear understanding of what our duties are and what the duties of some private investor is. And darüber hinaus. It's my opinion that private investors should never even set foot in the rainforests. At the end of the day, Mr. Melker didn't venture into untouched rainforest. As far as I know, yes. But he went into the forests which were still the property of the state government. Correct, yes. And we and I personally were always totally against that. Pucallpa, the region's capital, is adjacent to the Amazon region. The city attracts adventurers and profiteers, gold prospectors, illegal mining proprietors and lumberjacks. The capital is far away, and so is the hand of justice.
Major investor Dennis Melker also turned up one day, accompanied by Jochen Wieser. Wieser's right hand, palm oil expert Alfredo Rivera, was also with them. Dennis Melker established his headquarters on the fifth floor of this luxury hotel. In a company video by the Cacao de Peru company, which is also owned by Melka, he has the workers and their families celebrate him. También Denis Melka participó de la fiesta y bailó con mucha destreza y alegría. Alfredo Rivera, the man next to him, is his general manager. Previously, he had been Visa's project manager for the UN's palm oil plantations. He was already working for Melka when he was still on the UN's payroll. In a conversation I had with engineer Alfredo Rivera, he told me that Melka had made him the boss of the entire enterprise because his partner had vouched for him. He had told him, Alfredo was the right man, he knows the business. Who is this partner? His partner is Jochen Visa. In Aguatia, they invested into a plantation together. They also have a plantation in Tocach, which they co-own. Even if it is registered in another name. Alfredo definitely told me himself that he got the job because his partner had vouched for him with Melka. Yes, the first things Alfredo did was to demarcate, identify and negotiate the areas in question with the relevant ministries on a regional level and so on. That would be a help indeed for Mr. Malka. Of course it was a help. Aiding the destruction of rainforest to make room for agribusiness on a large scale. That's hardly compatible with the principles of the United Nations, nor with Peru's legislation. We take the Aguaitia, the side arm of the Amazon, to get to the crime scene. Dolores Noriega is forging an alliance against the destruction of the forest. She wants to win over the indigenous tribes of the region in order to stop the global biodiesel industry from advancing. Peru shall not become a second Indonesia. The regional president authorized the sale of the rainforest. He authorized the sale, yes. But now he's being investigated because it was illegal to grant the permission to clear the forest. Two penalty notices have been issued to Dennis Melka. Unfortunately, the government has so far abstained from collecting the cash. Penalty notices for what? One for the illegal marketing of the wood and a second one for clearing the forest without authorization. Unfortunately, Peruvian politicians can be bought, in which case they're even prepared to break Peruvian law. Two hundred and fifty people of the Shipibo tribe live in the community of Santa Clara de Oshunia. Their ancestral wood is gone. They were never even asked if they wanted to sell it. Together with other tribes, they are now taking legal action, without much hope for success. How much did they take away from you? Between seven and ten thousand hectares. How much land is yours altogether? 
The problem is that our ancestral land was never registered with the land registry. Our protest isn't reported in the media anymore at all. The company is too powerful and just keeps going. We need to reassemble to succeed in having Denis Melka expelled from the country. We had no idea. When the noise of the machine sounded over the river, we ran there and saw it. Previously, we used to go hunting there. We would have the first animal after 15 minutes. Now we walk all day to find a prey animal. Now everything is dead. The plants, the turtles, the anteaters. Everything gets flattened. Can we go there? No, it's too dangerous. We went there once with the state attorney from Pucallpa and the police. Even then they attacked us with clubs. They'll stop at nothing. The summer of 2015. A report by Peruvian TV show Panorama. The Shipibo are prevented by Melka's staff from entering their forest. No one takes our land away from us. Let me go through. Don't touch me. At this point in time, apart from General Manager Alfredo Rivera, five other members of Visa's UN team have joined Denis Melka. They help to free the land of trees, people and animals. We are reforesting with oil palms. That's a forest too, a secondary forest. We cleared the forest so that 5,000 people could get employment. And Mr. Visa knew nothing about this? I was asked to come to the meeting at the hotel. I went there and we discussed the issue. Rivera was there, Melka and Mr. Visa. What was the subject? What did they want from you? I was supposed to earmark areas which are suitable for planting oil palms, additional areas, because he wanted a total of 100,000 hectares. Was Mr. Visa for or against selling the forest to Melka? He held back at the meeting, most of the time. Mr. Rivera did the talking. Visa only agreed with everything. He said this or that zone is suitable. That was it. The Shipibo's village will die. Only the 200 hectares on the peninsula are left for the villagers. The hunting ground on the other side of the river already belongs to the investor. The front of the bulldozers, aided by the company's armed security forces, comes closer and closer every day. Denis Melka doesn't just have the forest near Pucallpa cleared. He's also doing it 600 kilometers to the north. Along the Amazon, he's had the forest cleared. The screws are being put on Amazonia from the north and the south. Without the help of Jochen Visa and his UN team, this wouldn't have been possible. The man from Hanover, who long ago set forth to change the world for the better, 
has eventually become the godfather of Dennis Melka, the destroyer of the rainforest. We just saw, OK, the man knows what he's doing. We'll take him to the field, end of story. And thank God this good man was open and objective enough. And at the end of the day, he became enthusiastic about these plantations. Did he have consultancy status with you? He had a consultancy contract, a short contract for four weeks, end of story. Did he have the idea back then to get into the palm oil business himself? He probably already had the idea, but it was definitely confirmed massively by the trip he took with us. We send our questions to the director of the UN Authority for Drugs and Crime in Vienna. How was it possible for UN subsidies to get into the hands of private businessmen? And why did the UN team help an investor to clear the rainforest in Peru? Two months later, we receive a reply. The UN authority is taking our research very seriously and has referred the case to the UN's internal investigation division. As long as the legal investigation is ongoing, there won't be any official statement. It's a very beautiful country. I feel at home here. The people are very nice, basically. But there's a lot of, in Germany you would say, mediocrity and a lot of corruption. It's goodbye, Peru. Jochen Wieser is on a new mission on behalf of the UN Organization on Drugs and Crime. We want him to teach farmers in Asia's Myanmar to plant coffee instead of opium poppies.